Okay. Okay, my, I'm sorry. Um, my technical difficulties here is related to the fact that um, my computer crashed this morning and I am struggling to be on camera as well as as share a PowerPoint that I had uh, available for you guys. But um, if you're not able to see me, hopefully you can hear me. And uh, so I'm gonna spend a bit of time um, discussing um, economic uh, resiliency or economic reconciliation um, with you guys today. And um, basically, I have undertaken uh, the last couple of years to write uh, uh, an economic reconciliation framework, um, specifically um, targeted towards uh, British Columbia. Um, however, it speaks broadly to, of course, uh, Canada at large um, and um, the diverse um, Indigenous nations that represent this country. Um, as the first peoples of this land. The long and short of it, um, we, in, uh, over this two year period, engaged uh, solely um, with a majority of indigenous stakeholders. And through that engagement um, resulted, uh, the end result of all this is all of that engagement um, with as many um, regions around the province as possible. Um, was this framework, um, and the framework dives into, um, for a lack of for a lack of a better word, just curiosity, creating curious spaces, um, a lot of questioning um, about wealth, um, and what does that mean uh, for First Nation communities. Um, both in a modern sense as well as in a traditional sense. So the framework um, lays out, um, I begin the journey in calling you to ceremony. And again, this, the, the foundation of, of this framework and, and the work I'm doing as a whole is uh, using an Indigenous worldview, an Indigenous lens, um, the traditional protocols, practices, ways of knowing and being. Um, as an Indigenous woman, as an Indigenous matriarch, as a hereditary chief, as a mother, um, I hold that space very dearly um, throughout this work. And so I question um, in, in this work, what is wealth? Um, what is wealth in that modern sense? What is wealth in the traditional sense? How do our traditional ways of knowing and being um, create again, curiosity and influence in the transformation of what um, that definition um, can and should be for us. Um, I am a believer in that our economic systems and spaces have to be utterly transformed. Um, what I go far uh, as far as saying they need to be completely dismantled. Yes, I could, I, I could hold space for that as well. Um, but as we dismantle those spaces, um, what does that transformation need to be? Um, what does it look like both in uh, First Nation communities and um, our surrounding settler uh, space, spaces, um, especially the economic spaces? And um, then how do we actually transform? Like, what are those calls to action? Um, to actually really not just dismantle, but then rebuild or, or again, transform and hold new space for, for what wealth could be for us or well-being. Because um, that's uh, a lot of the space that I hold um, is our actual well-being. I actually created a, a, a community wealth ripple as a result of this work as well that looks at, looks at the dynamics of um, what wealth is uh, around both wealth creation, wealth management, and wealth di distribution as a whole for our economic systems. 
Um, Because there's a multitude of economic systems that exist in our society. Um, There's, of course, the traditional GDP model um, that our capitalist system, economic system, solely relies on, very linear um, and um, also we have, you know, traditional economies, trade economies, circular economies, local economies, you know, there's just a lot of spaces um, that we hold our economic sisters, uh, systems in. We are all actors in that system. We are all playing in each of those realms um, and participating in a variety of ways. So, Having stated that, um, I take us through a journey on in this framework of um, looking at matriarchy, um, uh, local indigenous knowledge, wisdom, practices, protocols, ways of being, ways of doing, um, and using at that as the framework for transformation of our economic systems. And getting back to a more um, what CED calls a local economy. And, um, it, and this is really built on those, those principles of CED um, principles and practices and, and how those intertwine and interconnect with, again, those traditional First Nations indigenous values. And um, so we, throughout 189 pages of my document, um, I dissect, again, both this notion of matriarchy, um, what is wealth, um, and how do we be curious? So uh, the stepping into the river is 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 metaphorically a way to um, introduce the physical landscape of Mother Earth into the space of our economies, um, and through the stepping into the river. Um, what is it like, you know, to be in the flow of that river? What are the stepping stones? Um, and through the, again, this document, I talk about um, and introduce uh, the values of economic reconciliation, um, the stepping stones or the four principles or pillars. Um, and again, metaphorically thinking about like if, if you were looking at four pillar, pillars of a big house, um, what are those? And I introduced that in, in this framework as well. And, and in those stepping stones, in being in the flow of this river of economic reconciliation um, is these practices. What are the practices that we need to embark on um, in this journey? And it's, uh, I've laid it out um, uh, in a way where we look at it from a multitude of spaces, um, whether you're uh, working within a, a regional district, a municipality, um, within a publicly traded company, within a nonprofit, um, with a First Nation community and a dev corporation, you know, if you're a CED practitioner, you know, it doesn't really matter. I, I, the spaces, that um, we created uh, for curiosity was a lot of questioning and a lot of self-reflection. Um, so this is literally about um, holding up a mirror and questioning um, your space, yourself within that space, the space itself um, around um, what does wealth look like um, within these systems. And I, as an actor, you know, um, and yourselves as actors in these economic systems, what accountability and responsibility um, and role do you play in um, the transformation of what is our current state to a future state um, of well being in the country? And there's a I close with, again, uh, the document around um, the space of curiosity um, and dismantling or, or, or unlearning. I create a lot of space for unlearning um, is the best way to put it. Um, and that is basically the sense of decolonizing spaces. Um, 
as well as including indigenizing those spaces? And how do we um, lead that space um, with your local First Nation community? Because um, this is not a prescribed space. I don't give you a list of check boxes to say if I do these things, um, I am reconciled or I've done economic reconciliation and we can move on. Um, that's not um, what this document is about. It's not the hold that I, uh, the space that I hold whatsoever for this work. This is a lifelong journey. It is a journey that is gonna be inherited by our children. Um, but the call to action is immediate. It's creating the agency required to be responsible and accountable to the work that we need to do today in this here, in this now, and then each day after that. Um, so that when we uh, turn, turn to our children, um, you know, and our, and for me, my unborn grandchildren, um, I can tell them um, what I did, right? And, but more specifically and more importantly, they bear witness to the action um, in which I'm doing things in this work. Um, and that's to be in ceremony. That's why I, I, I begin this, uh, this work with a call to be in ceremony um, with each other, to be in relationship with each other. And it is, it is um, again, about creating those spaces locally. I can't say that um, the Haida Nation or the um, Tanaha people or um, the urban indigenous people in whichever community, um, um, I can't tell you what is, what is their economic reconciliation. Only they can tell you that. So again, the basis of this whole entire framework is the idea that you look locally to that wisdom, to that knowledge, to those First Nation communities, to the urban indigenous population in your regions, in your local communities um, as a, uh, to lead this space, um, to have agency and voice in this space of economic reconciliation, because they're the ones that are going to help you, um, you know, especially for or settler Canadians, um, understand what that is for, for your area. And because that's the biggest piece um, to this work. Um, again, there's no pan-Indigenous worldview. There's no pan-Indigenous way of doing things. There's no pan-Indigenous pre prescribed space for economic reconciliation. This is built on relationship with your First Nation communities and urban Indigenous population, urban and, and, and Indigenous youth and community, um, and the elders and the knowledge keepers and the land protectors and the matriarchs. They all have um, agency in this space and they should be given that um, wealth of time, effort and energy to contribute to um, what's possible to again, to that future state. And I, I'm, I hope that sums it up. Um, I, I currently don't have, uh, the document is finalized. Um, however, we are just uh, embarking on our launch plan uh, for this document, for this framework. Uh, um, however, um, if you were to go to the SFU um, Community Economic Development webpage, uh, you will find all the work that I have done so far. Um, there's a lot of stories that are there that speak to a lot of this space. Um, the framework itself, um, sections of the framework, as well as the executive summary are going to be out very, very shortly. Um, and also um, probably um, various events where um, you're going to be hearing a lot more um, of the, this work. Um, and I can share the presentation. Um, hopefully I get over my technical difficulties here and we'll be able to share it um, with each of you and um, possibly hopefully uh, send out a, the, uh, the document itself for you to start reading. Um, prior to the launch itself um, on our website and through our various networks. Um, I am also embarking on a journey of, of uh, um, doing a specialized podcast 
around this work and also a launch of videos um, that speak to this work through um, storytelling. Um, because uh, as First Nations people, you know, we're an oral um, uh, communities and how we share our wealth and knowledge um, teachings um, is all through uh, our, our spoken word, through our songs, through our storytelling um, and protocols and practices and ceremony um, with each other um, and with the land and with the ancestors. And um, I think that's very, uh, what I'm speaking to here is also very much reflected uh, throughout the document as well. Um, I speak to um, not just humanity needing to do this work, um, but how we need to lead this work for the well-being of all living creatures um, and for our spirits, um, for the ancestors and for the people yet to be, that those being um, our future children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and many generations to come. Because um, the legacy, again, that we're leaving is, is um, the work that we're doing today. Our ancestors worked very hard um, to get to where we are and to be um, the economic players that we are in this Canadian society and making the best of that colonial system uh, to generate um, financial wealth uh, for our communities. Um, but I'm here to question and be curious about how do we use our traditional knowledge, um, our traditional systems um, and leverage that wealth um, and that knowing and that being into these systems so that we can combine them and have that two-eyed seeing um, to better create um, what we call or what we understand to be the well-being um, uh, uh, of our collective, right? Um, and not centering just a certain thing on this linear scale of what is valued um, and what the outcomes need to be for us. Because for Indigenous communities, um, and I speak for my communities, I speak for my family, I speak for my son um, when I say this, um, but I also speak for it, the larger communities through our engagements um, by what they shared with us about that wealth um, that we need to lean on our own um, values of what wealth is for us um, at the center of uh, this, you know, hopefully transformed economic system. And to literally see um, the power that we truly have as Indigenous peoples um, to create that transformation, that we can lead the charge um, and that we have, um, I am not a fan of the word power, um, but we hold, um, we can hold many spaces for that well-being in this new economic um, way of being. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's a, that, pretty much without having shared the document with, with you or having shared <laughs> my PowerPoint, again, because of my technical difficulties, um, I think that's kind of all of it in the nutshell. Um, but there's so much more richer and deeper spaces, not only in this document, um, but in the storytelling that I do in the webinars that I've been in um, and the many other spaces that I hold. Um, I didn't share with you um, my traditional um, name and who, where I come from, um, but I carry um, two ancestral names, um, Shapelamat Siam. Um, Shapelamat is a feminized version of, of my father's and all of the ancestors that carried uh, the name Shapelam before me. The Ot at the end of my name, feminizes the name. So it tells you um, that the person carrying the name is a woman. And the Siam um, at the, in that is loosely translates into head of the family. Um, so that tells you the position that I hold within the family. And so in, in colonial terms, in the English language, I am a hereditary chief. 
I also carry a Kwakwaka'wakw uh, uh, name uh, of uh, Kwisolauk, and this is from my Chichia on my, my mother's side of the family. My son is, has three names. He's been blessed with the Seal name, a Squamish name, and a Kwakwaka'wakw name. And um, he carries, carries a very powerful Kwakwaka'wakw name. And it has to do with uh, his wealth, the wealth that he has. Um, and I was born and raised in Oslohan in North Vancouver, uh, the beautiful West Coast shores of North Vancouver um, within my own traditional territory of the Skoltmish people. Um, I also am a descendant of the Tsiolotuth peoples, um, our sister nation in North Vancouver. I uh, come from, I hail from the Thomas family um, through there. I am the hereditary chief of the Lackett Joe family within the Squamish nation. And I am also a descendant of the Frank Wilson families uh, on the East Coast shores of Vancouver Island, um, more specifically in the Courtney, Comox, Campbell River areas of Vancouver Island. Um, I live, work and play in my husband's traditional unceded territories um, of the Inca Kalam and Seal speaking people. Um, we reside in Merritt, British Columbia. And uh, my husband has family ties throughout the whole entire in, uh, entire interior in into um, down to the border and lucky enough that we are raising our son in all of our cultures and um, the I should also mention the my name uh, Shupelamat uh, I'm the only one that carries this name in the family um, in my community, uh, that name is synonymous with the one who has, who, who is the head of the family and nobody else carries it. Whereas uh, in, for other family members, um, names can be carried um, by four individuals within a family, right? So I, I just wanna mention that's a unique feature of, of the name that I carry as well. So that's a little bit about who I am uh, where I come from and the cultures that I hail from and um, telling you a bit about my value systems based on that culture, based on the lands that I was born and bred and work, live and play in. And um, so I think that is about as much as I can recall at the moment for this presentation. I'm hoping that there are some questions, some curiosities, dialogue. I'm, I am a huge fan of uh, dialogue. So if anybody wants to ask a question, share a thought, I, 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 bring, I ask you to bring that forward. I have a question. My name is Karen Bruno. I live in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Karen. Right now, I'm working on a task force to end poverty. End poverty Edmonton. And um, given that um, Edmonton has sort of the second biggest um, population, urban population um, in the city, um, we're trying to look at economic reconciliation within an urban setting. And so um, I've been working with the, um, with my team and um, other members, uh, along with some of the members of the city to understand what economic reconciliation means in an urban setting. I know a lot of um, different bands and stuff have their understandings, but trying to find sort of a, an understanding of what that looks like in an urban setting, given that you know Edmonton also um, is a gateway for the north, west, south, and east. We have a lot of different populations of Indigenous people there, and um, so I'm just wondering if you have any advice um, in terms of urban settings, economic reconciliation for Indigenous people, and uh, yeah, that's kind of just my question. I would, I would, my natural inclination or my intuition is, is, is literally holding the same space 
um, say as a First Nation would, right? Despite the diversity of indigenous cultures, um, probably within that urban setting, um, the value sets, right, that come from your traditional way of being and doing um, are yours. They're, they're, and more than likely, the overlapping of those value sets um, are going to be um, uh, the same, very common amongst uh, that diverse cultural um, knowledge and identifying um, what those value sets are. Um, and then through those value sets, identifying, you know, what is sacred to you as urban indigenous peoples. Um, you know, uh, you know, is the the land and the water and language, um, you know, is entrepreneurship. Um, again, what defining um, for yourselves, um, what is the most sacred to you, um, and using those values and 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 identifying those sacred spaces. Um, to then bridge that uh, space of economic reconciliation. So having identified that for yourselves, um, now what? Who would we then um, share this with and how do we continue in, to engage um, around um, say collaborations, partnerships um, with the city, with the regional districts, with, um, you know, town, the town's um, recreation centers or libraries or public spaces, um, what does that look like for us? Uh, um, and I think that would be um, your, your, the strengths needed um, to bridge the relationships and partnerships and collaborations needed um, to move towards economic reconciliation. Um, I would also speak to the idea of um, land use planning, um, purchasing of fee simple lands uh, for say certain developments that are required for in urban indigenous peoples. Um, and again, what might that look like? Um, but again, as an ind indigenous urban um, peoples, you have to identify exactly the foundation in which you want to build all of those things on, right? I hope that answers no, your that, question. That, yeah, that, that does help. That, I, I definitely went in that direction with first going to the diverse Indigenous community members. So yeah, that does help a lot. Thank you. Yeah, because again, if you don't know what your foundation is, you might be misguided and going in too many different directions, right? This helps, you know, solidify, um, again, the diversity. Um, and again, finding those commonalities is gonna be the key, right? Just like indigenous nations themselves in a region, um, they may speak different dialects of languages. Um, their territories could be in various, um, spaces of uh, for development purposes or resource extraction or you know um, as well as resource protection and sustainability food sovereignty food security um, and they too themselves just like in a, you know an urban indigenous population has to find those those value sets that are common to them um, as well as identifying both their strengths um, what capacities that need to be built. That's the other thing is, is developing the capacity um, of, of your peoples, right? Even in an urban indigenous setting. And what does that look like um, amidst all of the potential um, project program, infrastructure, land development or economic development um, that could happen um, within your within your uh, localized community. And your biggest leverage in an urban environment is going to be entrepreneurship. That's going to be a tremendous source source of, of, of wealth generation, I think in, in any community. Yes, okay. well, thank you. That's 
that's been awesome. You've gave me some good ideas. like me to speak and delve deeper into. That's also a place that I'd be willing to go to. Sorry, I'm, if no one's gonna say anything, could you talk a little bit more about the, the framework that you developed for economic reconciliation? Um, a little bit more in detail what that what that looks like and is it something that i could look at as a as a guide i guess yes uh for sure like i said um i would i had a full-on powerpoint of everything that this framework was for you guys and again i'm sorry my technology is is not allowing me to share this powerpoint with you let alone and you can't even see me because of my technology issues um but again, so the long and short of the framework is a discussion around our current state. So the truth of economic reconciliation. And I take the readers on a journey of what is the truth behind um, colonization of Canada and those long standing and intergenerational impacts of that colonization um, on uh, Indigenous peoples. Um, from C to C. And, you know, and how does this, how has that impacted um, our, and created um, an economic dependency on these institutions and systems um, in an economic way? And the disparities and barriers that exist um, for Indigenous peoples as wards of the crown. Um, as not owning our reserve lands um, and the ability to access capital and um, be in an equitable um, place for economic development because of that lack of access, because of those disparities, because of those barriers um, and how we are seen as we being Indigenous peoples are seen as um, problems or being high risk um, to economic development um, because of a multitude of things, uh, because of our um, colonial capitalist um, economic systems that drive this uh, engine of what is considered wealth. Um, and what is valued as wealth. And again, after I share um, in the document about understanding that space, um, I do really um, take a lot of space uh, to talk about, like I said, what is wealth? What is cultural wealth? Um, and using two-eyed seeing um, to bring awareness to our wealth as Indigenous peoples, right? And for me, wealth isn't the fact that you or my neighbor or my cousin has a dollar more in their bank account. That means you are financially wealthier than I, if you have a dollar more in your bank account than I do. But I have, um, as an Indigenous woman, as a matriarch, as a leader, as a mother, as a community member of many nations, um, my wealth is in my well being. And my well being stems from my lands, my language, my culture, my ceremonies, our origin stories, our storytelling, um, our elders, our ancestors, our spirits, um, from all living creatures to the reciprocal relationship that I have to all of those living creatures, right? To um, the spiritual connection to. Um, mythological places and spaces in our culture, into our ceremonial practices. Um, I am rich because um, I can have my son um, do rites of passage, his young manhood training. Um, I am wealthy um, because we can bring him out onto the land. 
Um, I am wealthy because he is learning his title and rights by being on the land, by going to pick medicines, um, learning to make those medicines, by hunting, by fishing, by learning the 13 moon cycles and how you live within um, that calendar, to know who he is as a man, um, to dream about the man that he is still to become. I am wealthy because of all of those things. And I speak to that um, greatly throughout the document to again, create the curiosity needed for settler um, Canadians um, to embark on the journey of what that might be for them as well. Where does, what is wealth beyond um, this dollar or GDP value um, of that wealth creation? Um, how are they interacting with the land in which they choose to live? What relationship do they have to it? What is their relationship to the Indigenous peoples in their backyards? What is the true history of those lands? Not let the settler colonial history, but before that, what is that history? And after we, after I discuss um, a lot of that understanding of, of wealth from a, a traditional um, Indigenous way of knowing and being, um, I go into more of the a guidebook frame framework. Um, again, very colonial way of seeing it, um, but discussing what it is, what are those values that we need to hold in a transformative economy, in a well-being economy, um, in a love-based economy, um, as well as those stepping stones and practices to help us make that transformation. And our transformation is only come, is going to come through being curious. And then through that curiosity, um, be able to identify, um, again, the purpose and meaning of that transformative economy for that localized community and what that looks like in relationship with each other. And again, a lot of uh, the document um, you'll see when I share it with you is just a lot of reflection. It's a lot of curiosity and um, creating space to take deep dives um, about it. Literally, it's about going into your heart um, and, and really engaging with that side of yourself around um, what economic model, what Again, the future state, do you want? Do you vision, right? What do you want to hold space for? Um, and how are you going to create agency? Um, how are you going to be a change agent or um, a transformer, trickster in all of that? And how do you use the wealth of your Indigenous knowledge, um, if you're an Indigenous person, to do that? Um, and then I close off a journey with a whack of resources, um, court cases that, is, that have transformed um, title and rights um, that have created UNDRIP, DRIPA in British Columbia, um, and looking at and questioning even systems like uh, impact benefit agreements for communities um, and questioning those economic tools um, and are they truly working for us, right, kind of thing. Yeah, that was a very long-winded answer. So. <laughs> but I hope, it, I hope it does give you a gist without visually seeing um, what I hope to share with you in the near future. Are there any more questions?